everyone. Welcome to the Stoa. Uh, today's session is called Becoming a Philosopher Entrepreneur. Uh, we have Michael and Yosef uh, from the Vision X Forum Foundation joining us. Uh, and uh, Vision X Forum is a transformative uh, online training program for entrepreneurs that leverages the abstract and esoteric wisdom of the ages to enrich STEM based ways of thinking with new methods of value creation. Mm. I always get excited uh, when uh, by projects that make philosophy accessible, hence why I invited uh, Michael and Yosef uh, to the STOA. And I'm going to take them in the moment, they'll introduce themselves and uh, share uh, uh, their uh, screen to present on Vision X form. And uh, then we'll jump into Q&A. So if you have questions anytime, pop in the chat. I'll call and you can ask your question to Michael Yosef. We're here for around uh, 60 minutes. Um, so that being said, gentlemen, welcome to the STOA. And Tag, uh, you're it. Okay, thanks very much for having us. Good to be with everybody. Thanks for having us. Let me share my screen here. So we're discussing becoming a philosopher entrepreneur. And Yosef and I, we each have come to this topic in slightly different ways. So my background is in political science and political philosophy. And in political philosophy, there is already the idea that philosophy is going to be implemented in some way or has something practical to say about political life, about political community. It's not just the pure abstraction. So one of the ideas that Yosef and I are sort of arguing against is that there's a consensus among some philosophical types that philosophy should keep its hands clean of practice. It shouldn't get involved somehow in business. It's dirty for a philosopher to think about money and that kind of thing. You know, philosophy has to be very virginal, very pure. Well, in political philosophy, that's not the case because like I said, it already moves into questions of politics and law. So that's one area of interest. And then the other is that uh, when I left the University of Toronto where I did my studies, I opened up my own online school teaching philosophy outside of the university system. So I myself am practicing philosophical entrepreneurship by teaching philosophy in my online school. So that's like, again, very different from the purely academic, pure thought approach to things. And Yosef has his own sort of uh, way of coming to this middle ground between philosophy and practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been uh, involved in entrepreneurship for about a dozen years, uh, about half of that in uh, oncology biotechnology. And I've been interested in philosophy and studying and testing it out since since college. And on the flip side of that, several some of my uh, colleagues and, uh, and, and friends in the entrepreneurial space don't see the value of philosophy. They think, you know, it's uh, one quote I heard is knowing a whole lot about nothing at all. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, questioning of what's the actual practical value of philosophy. Uh, and so one of the goals of Vision X form is to concretize the value, concretize the, the toolkit that philosophy instills uh, and enables, uh, especially for entrepreneurial ventures and value creation. So it's not uh, completely unprecedented for there to be an interest in philosophy among entrepreneurs. So for example, here's the Entrepreneurs Weekly Nietzsche and uh, Brad Feld, he's I think a venture capitalist. You may know uh, Reid Hoffman here, the founder of LinkedIn, also has done a podcast on the philosopher entrepreneur where interestingly he talks about like nuanced readings of Socrates, including Xenophons, another person besides Plato who wrote about Socrates. So they're both, and he also writes about Nietzsche and Wittgenstein showing that, you know, there are philosophical insights that can help with business. Peter Thiel, a very famous entrepreneur, very famous founder, has written, as I'm sure some of you know, not just this essay, The Straussian Moment, which mentions Leo Strauss, Carl Schmitt, René Girard, but he also has the book Zero to One, which has many applied philosophical insights. Uh, Stoicism, clearly, as Peter, and I'm sure uh, Peter, your audience knows, has been a resource for people who are thinking about emotional self-control in the context of business and entrepreneurship and life. So here you have this book, Ancient Stoic Wisdom and Practical Advice for uh, Modern Management, Stoicism for Business. So there's some background already, some pre-existing background of entrepreneurs with an interest in applied philosophy. And also uh, this book, uh, Investing the Last Liberal Art, which uh, talks about the lattice work way of knowledge and the value out of philosophy 
Um, it, it's, it's a book I read in college and largely influenced the way I would approach finance because finance at a certain level of abstraction is actually competition of belief, competition of different philosophies instantiated in a trading strategy or an investment strategy in the market, trying to survive, create profit, and measure that profit uh, or measure that performance given conceptions of risk, which are also deeply philosophical, um, largely mathematized, but still uh, the, the underpinning comes down to epistemology. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the next, and, and this is clearly appreciated by people who work with uncertainty on a daily basis, uh, like Naval. Uh, Naval is quite famous uh, in the industry for creating, creating his vision and making it into a philosophy, into how he sees the world. So keep in mind as well, there are other figures you know and have heard of, some that we can name, others that we can't name. You know, Curtis Yarvin, somebody who clearly is an entrepreneurial founder space with a background in philosophy, Mark Andreessen, somebody. So clearly there is some record, some evidence of people who are dealing with new projects, big money, creative ventures, who have said that what they do is done better with a familiarity uh, with philosophy, through a familiarity with philosophy. Yeah. So our basic idea and the way, the way these two things come together tightly is entrepreneurship is the application of a set of beliefs and a way of updating those beliefs. Uh, so instead of making an argument and trying to convince somebody uh, to change their beliefs, you're, work, you're directly interacting with reality. Uh, so in, instead of an argument being made in words, you're making an argument in action, and the feedback comes in action. Uh, it, it comes from, from the reality that you inhabit in your lifetime. And when you think about it at one level of higher abstraction, what is the purpose of thinking? And you put an, uh, a, an evolutionary lens on it, that thinking is an adaptation for survival. If you think of the purpose of thinking as increasing your chances of survival and replication, uh, and amassing resources is central to that function, any tools, cognitive or otherwise, um, that increase your ability to amass resources is quality. I mean, that, that, is, that would be an evolutionary definition of quality. And what philosophy does, in, uh, in, in our opinion, is it gives you those tools, it sharpens your tools, and therefore it has this pragmatic value within an evolutionary framework. That's why we created the course, and that's that's how we uh, that's that's one of the ways we approached it and and designed the curriculum. Okay, so um, in other words, stated uh, in this way, so entrepreneurs can benefit from philosophical arguments and ideas. Again, it's not totally obvious because for some people, philosophy is just too abstract, and too unrelated to practice. But look, entrepreneurs deal all the time with things that philosophers have examined with very intense care, like emotional self-control, thoughts about the future, clearly something that's of relevance when you're investing, when you're projecting, when you're calculating risk, fears, hopes, ideas, imagination. You know, what is the role of imagination in perception? What are you doing when you're imagining a future for a uh, specific, like future value for a business and things like that? Perspective, interpretation, inspiration. If you're going to be creating something new, it actually matters, well, what are the sources of inspiration? Where do you get sort of that kind of insight that you can latch onto for the establishment of something new? Analysis, worldviews, uh, modes and methods of reasoning. Clearly, if you're thinking about what's working and what's not working in a business, you're employing all kinds of modes of reasoning, logic, and so on. So not to mention power, gain, morality, justice, communication, community, like it's clear that an entrepreneur is embedded in concerns of that kind, concerns that philosophers have made it in some sense their business to study very carefully. And at the same time, philosophers, and by the same token, philosophers can benefit from the entrepreneur's activity and experience. And again, as someone who comes out of academic philosophy, academic circles, I think this insight was really missing among philosophers, to what extent they can learn something of philosophical value from practitioners. So why again, entrepreneurship is the application in the real world of unique insights into what's possible, what's valuable, what works, what's in demand, 
right? What people want, how people react, how they think, uh, and what can be hoped for. So today's entrepreneurs, as I mentioned at the start, I alluded to this, they're almost like the political founders who have always interested philosophers. So for example, Machiavelli writes about political founders, founders of regimes. Um, and why have founders always interested philosophers? Because they're on the bridge, they're a transition, kind of like a Jacob Flatter, so to speak, between pure thought and its concretization. So in the past, in political philosophy, a founder like Moses, okay, or Cyrus, was considered to be a special figure. He's not just like every other citizen, because he's the one who founds the possibility of citizenship in the first place. Entrepreneur does something similar. An entrepreneur founds a realm or a domain of economic activity and of life uh, expression. So we're thinking in this program less about political philosophy, but more about its analog, you know, its analogy and parallel in business and in companies and in ventures. So the philosopher entrepreneur, who is the philosopher entrepreneur as a figure? We have this kind of summary. If the aim of thought is the world and the self as part of the world, so you are embedded in the world. You're not a, you're not a brain in a vat. You're not an intellect that's disembodied. You are thinking in the world. So thought must interact with the world. It's part of a system of feedback with the world. That's number one. Number two, entrepreneurs generate new businesses on the basis of thought and intuition, and it has to get validated by interaction with the world, right? You, somehow your thought, the, the rubber of your thought meets the road of the market, of the business, of the application. Uh, so the philosopher entrepreneur or entrepreneur philosopher, I guess you could put it either way, is neither so enmeshed in the world of commerce that the realm of thought is kept in the darkness. It's not like all about the business operations with no higher philosophical reflection, that would be like, you know, uh, amputated soul in some sense, but neither is it the other way, like purely in the realm of thought and thinking that everybody who's in practice is somehow uh, doing philosophy a disservice or, you know, selling out or something like that. No, the founder is a liminal Dionysian figure expressing the synergy between thought and its embodiment in projects thought in action, thought in motion. You have both elements there in this philosopher entrepreneur figure. And um, connecting, connecting your entrepreneurial activity um, with, with your beliefs, uh, I, I, that creates you know, the, uh, an authentic way of, of, of leadership and that connects to your personal philosophy, whether you know it or not. Um, and for example, the aim of business is to achieve a certain end that is good or beneficial. Well, you have an idea of the good. Uh, in, in my case, I came to the idea of the good starting from the idea of what I considered evil, which is needless suffering. So anything that would decrease needless suffering uh, would be good, which is how I reconcile you know, what, I, what I work on uh, which is cancer therapeutics, with what I think is good. And that sustains, uh, that sustains effort over the very long term. Uh, but again, going into the question of what is good is pure philosophy. It, 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 it has components maybe of intuition, maybe of rationality, uh, of different ways of approaching it, but it's a fundamentally philosophical question. And understanding it and understanding what you believe in and how you believe in it and connecting that with what you do on a day-to-day -day basis uh, creates a more integrated life and I think has, is very likely to create better businesses, partially because it's, it ha it's truly inspirational. When you, when you have a clear idea of what you're doing and why you're doing it, it's easier uh, to recruit people to join the mission to do something that's good, uh, it 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 it, it, uh, it connects external and intrinsic rewards. Um, so that's very powerful. Yeah, and here obviously reflection on what is good, what constitutes the good, what are the obstacles to the good. Take Plato's Republic, if you don't mind me just saying this really quickly in passing, they're looking into the question of what justice would entail in the political community, and they see that like if you want perfect justice perfect commitment to the common good, you have to destroy the family because the family is a private good. 
Now, this is a theoretical project in the Republic, you know, but it shows you that when you think about what's good, when you actually think about it, problems arise that require some analysis, you know, same in a business. You have to be able to think through what does it mean to bring a benefit of such a kind to such a community? What does it mean to want to solve such a problem in a way? You know, what should be the relationship between my moral concerns and my self-seeking, profit-seeking concerns? All of these types of questions clearly are involved in, the, in operating a business, but aren't necessarily always treated with the level of sophistication that you can get through a philosophical type analysis. I just want to say briefly, uh, everybody, before we move on to the next slide here, that you could get the sense that thinking about morality and business opens the door for using moral rhetoric as a kind of like BS smokescreen, you know, and there are examples of that recently where under the language of like, I want to be doing good in the world, you know that you're just getting a pass to rip people off so long as you put on a happy face about it. And it seems like you're going to be, you know, saving the whales and in and, and the forests and everything else like that, right? So that's not what we're talking about here. We don't mean a smoke screen that allows you to operate ruthlessly uh, with no real concern for ethics and morality. We mean like, what is a genuine inquiry into the intent and telos of business uh, activity? And so we can we can conceptualize the the whole cycle um, be, through you have a philosophy, uh, what, and that translates into an idea. The idea then is instantiated into a business. Now that business creates profit or loss, which is the feedback mechanism which invalidates or refines your philosophy, regenerating the idea. It's, uh, it's philosophy with skin in the game because it creates real world feedback. And this is the simple model that you know, we, we came to delineate it. Yeah, and this, uh, this idea of you know, a life-giving loop, right? That, that the growth takes place within this cycle. That's, I think you can see in the image, the idea conveyed there. And whenever you do have a philosophy, uh, whenever you do have a philosophy, it has, uh, you live it, right? And when you live it experientially, you, you understand its limitations and its values. So one of the first philosophies that I adopted uh, when, I was, when I was quite young was Stoicism. And it was very valuable because it's, it's great for emotional regulation, for self-control. Um, and it's a uniquely powerful philosophy for getting through hard times and bad times, but it's got side effects. Uh, largely, it, you, don't, you don't get the highs of when it's good. You also don't share the vulnerability and create the connection that you could otherwise if, you, if you're not such a stone. Um, so it, it, when, when I was fully committed to stoicism as my ideal, the stoic ideal of uh, being independent from the outside world, having noble intent, and then let the chips fall where they may, uh, it's, it's in some ways a very defensive and protective posture. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't allow for flights of fancy or inspiration as much as uh, certain other philosophical schools do. Um, so adopting a philosophy it has it has practical benefits, and it also has it, it can have terrible side effects. I mean, I, I um, so so yeah. Here we have the, the the following type of reflection. So first of all, I know that we're in the Stoa, right, Peter? I assume uh, many of the people who are here and who will be watching later, you know, feel close to the Stoic tradition, and that's fine. The key insight, rather, is that you know, in Yosef's case, when he adopted this personally, there were these limitations about full self expression. And you know the feeling that it has like a defensive mechanism so what that does is it opens the door to the following question if we're interested in the relationship between business and philosophy and we see that one of the most popular schools i think of applied philosophy for business people is stoicism but clearly there's more to philosophy than stoicism and there may be some limitations in that particular approach question is what would it look like to go beyond stoicism in thinking about the relationship between philosophy and entrepreneurship? In other words, as you see, are there other resources in philosophy that are 
less often used when we think about entrepreneurship, but that give us useful tools for quote unquote being in the world as philosopher entrepreneurs. And those of you who don't know, that's Martin Heidegger. And Martin Heidegger is famous, among other things, for this hyphenated phrase, being in the world, suggesting that one of the philosophical resources that I personally found to be valuable and that we've incorporated into the course materials is Heidegger. And there's a surprising side of the Heidegger story that's not very well known. So I'll just say for the benefit of those of you who may not know too much about Heidegger, that besides being the most famous philosopher of the 20th century, whose 1927 work being in time is mandatory reading, he was also a Nazi. And that's usually what people think about when they think about him. How could the greatest philosopher have also been a Nazi? And so there are debates about his political philosophy in that context. But the reception of Heidegger's thought also has this less known branch. It branched off into a field of ontological life coaching consultant manage, leadership management and training, consultants, that type of thing, where it was a hyper focus on how we are being in our various relations in the world and how our being is reflected in our speaking. So let me take a step back. This guy right here, Werner Erhard, you may or may not know or have heard of, he founded a famous movement in the 70s called EST, which later became Landmark Education and is now called Landmark Worldwide. And he was someone who pioneered the application of Heideggerian inquiry into like regular domains of life. So he wrote here, I'm a student of Heidegger. Heidegger had a new way of looking at it all. He had the problem of having to use words from the old way of looking at it. Now for Heidegger, that's like old language from philosophy, like Fusis, Aletheia and stuff like that. So he had to use the old words to try to create some access to his new way of looking. And here, Werner Erhard says he's got the same problem. He's using terminology from existing explanations to give us a new way of looking at performance. So for him, Heidegger was a key to is assessing how to have breakthrough performance, including performance in business, which is really surprising, very distinct from the uh, other schools of um, business ethics and philosophical uh, entrepreneurship. So what's kind of the question between Heidegger in business? It's tricky because Heidegger is best known separately from the politics. In terms of the questions he raised, he's best known for thinking about the meaning of being. What is the meaning of being? He's written thousands of pages, many of which I have lectured on to the eternal consternation of my students because it's not so easy all the time to understand what he's saying. But he wants to know about the meaning of being. And one question that he raises famously is this. Why is there something rather than nothing? A Heideggerian question. And there's a link between that question, why is there something rather than nothing? And the definition of the founder, the entrepreneurial founder, as someone who creates something from nothing. So there's a surprising, unexpected, and very rich parallelism between what Heidegger says concerning speech, being and the relationship between speaking and being to nothing and you know the the founder's problem of creating something new so we look at the meaning of being a founder of being somebody who creates something from nothing using the tools of heideggerian ontology or heideggerian philosophy in the course very i think surprising uh, and almost unprecedented type of inquiry so again, as I say here, we use the Heideggerian fundamental ontology, his inquiry into the meaning of being, to explore being in the world, your expression in your business, in your projects, and in your life, as an entrepreneur who creates something from nothing. And there are not a lot of resources, existing resources for us to draw on. You know, I think that we're contributing here to this pioneering approach. But here are a few from the original fathers of ontological life coaching, people like Erhard and this other guy, Fernando Flores. So here are a few of the books uh, that we uh, discuss. And you can see in this one, Disclosing New Worlds, if you see the subtitle, Entrepreneurship. Okay, never mind. We don't talk much about the democratic action and the cultivation of solidarity, but they use a Heideggerian lens to reveal something fascinating about the meaning of being an entrepreneur. So an example of this would be... Um... Oh, well, an, an example of a philosophical tool towards uh, towards entrepreneurial action would be redescription. 
And when you look, when you look here, what you see most likely is a right triangle, because that's what you've seen a million times in school in geometry class. Uh, but what else could it be? Uh, let me just say really quickly, sorry, <laughs> I was abrupt in the transition. So one of the philosophers that we draw on in the program is Heidegger, as I said, another one of the philosophers that we draw on giving you another example of the kind of thing we look at in the VXF program is this notion of redescription, primarily developed by Wittgenstein, okay, or Wittgenstein, however you want to say it. So here now we return to the question, right, you're looking at a right triangle, but what else could you say about it? Or what else is it? <laughs> So yeah, it could be, uh, Kevin writes, one of those electric chairs that old people used to go up stairways. Um, what, could it be a perfect triangle? Well, actually, yes. If you look at, if you think that it's uh, from a perspective and you're looking at it from the side, it, if you, if, then, then it could be a perfect triangle. Also, could it be, it could be a cutout uh, or it could be a full shape could be a three-dimensional shape that we're seeing from one angle, half of a rectangle, a sundial. There are diff that's absolutely right. We can, we can look at this ambiguous signal and we can interpret it and redescribe it in different ways. Uh, so what Whittingsey writes is, Take as an example the aspects of a triangle. Triangle can be seen as a triangular whole, solid geometrical drawing, as standing on its base, hanging from its apex as a mountain, as a wedge, as an arrow pointer, or overturned object, which is meant to stand on the shorter side of the right angle as a half parallelogram and as various other things. You can think of this now and you can look at it and regard it now as this and as and and now as uh, <clears throat> now as this and, uh, and then you'll yeah, see sorry. it now this way and now this yeah. yeah so we initially look if we started with what is it oh, it's obvious it's clear everybody knows right away you know why are you even wasting our time with this obviously it's a right triangle like we this is what we spent our time together on like come on man but no you know you depends in a sense it depends your instant take on what it is not at all necessarily the one that is most useful not to say anything about whether it's the one that's most accurate or true so i just wanted to add that yosef yeah or take the little prince uh if you, you might remember the little prince draws this form which all the adults think of as a hat and uh, and then the it's actually an elephant that's been eaten by a python, I believe. <laughs> and um, if you if you look at the original drawing, actually, if you if you if you try to see it as a hat, then explaining that the eye of the of the snake would be pretty hard to do. But they probably didn't notice it. Uh, and also the relationship the relationship towards uh, the snake slash hat is very different in the in the adult view versus the how the little prince sees it um, interestingly uh, this this can be there's a parallel here with the relaxation of priors so in a bayesian system a bayesian updating uh, you see something as you expect to see it so any any signal comes in and that uh, that snaps into uh, a belief now, the belief is informed par uh, partially from your prior belief, from, from your priors, and partially, uh, uh, partially from the signal. Uh, if your priors are very, very strong, uh, I mean, the most extreme would be a prior of one, that means regardless of what the signal is, you're going to see the same thing. Um, so what, what redescription allows us to do, if, if I could use this as a bit of a metaphor, is that it allows us to relax our priors uh, and be able to reinterpret and see th and see things that we otherwise could not see because of our previously held beliefs. This is this is uh, this has another parallel in uh, the visual field under the influence of psychedelics. Um, there there has been been multiple simulations where uh, the in in computer vision where the relaxation of Bayesian priors creates visual effects that are very much akin to the experience of consuming psychedelics, according to 
many many people and pretty much it's it's uh quite quite obvious you know uh, and and um that's uh this this all part of the same process how much do you know before you even see and then how much can you relax what you can see and therefore open up the perceptual space yeah i just wanted to add something here before we go to the next slide so Yo yosef said that in this uh, little prince example the adults who look at the top drawing and who see it automatically as a hat okay, automatically right because it roughly fits the shape of everything else that they've seen and called a hat before whereas they haven't seen the inside of a snake that's eaten an elephant before so they automatically see it as a hat he said they wouldn't notice the eye the snake's eye so just think about that when you automatically snap something into a previously already there interpretation like that's a hat it comes with a blindness to something else that is in principle accessible like the eye is in principle accessible we can see it but it disappears from view somehow when you snap something into just the existing category so part of the underlying idea of vision transform what does it mean to transform your vision it means to have things that you are currently blind to not because they're not there but because some other description has snapped everything into place, some other priors have snapped everything into place. Now that's functional. It's not necessarily stopping business people and entrepreneurs and yourselves and us from living a normal life. We're alive, right? We're all more or less well enough to be here on a Wednesday night together. But the question is, does it blind us from some more intense and valuable access to the possibility of something new? Because if you're going to be building a business, or you're going to be an entrepreneur, a founder, you don't want to be blind to the little details. You want to make sure that they come out to you. So we spend a lot of time looking at how that works. And redescription is uh, part of it for sure. And then just one other thing I want to add briefly, if you don't mind, this is similar, right? It's like snapping our perceptions into the existing models, uh, the, the sort of perceptual blindness that comes with that. But another one is you, I'm sure have heard about Socrates. If you know anything about him, okay, you know he drank the hemlock and stuff like that, but you know that he was famous for his wisdom, which consisted in knowing that he doesn't know the most important things, doesn't know the answer to the most important things. Socrates is not knowing, allows him to be curious, allows him to learn, allows him to inquire. Now, the opposite of that is believing that you do know everything relevant. Believing that you do know everything relevant has the effect of shutting down, shutting off, closing down, closing off. So philosophy and entrepreneurship are intimately related in the sense that the spirit of curiosity that is represented by Socrates is knowing that he doesn't know, allows you to see what not everybody else sees, allows you to be struck in a new way by the world, allows you to do something new in it, uh, with it, and for it. Yeah. So here I wanted to uh, I wanted to bring this out. The idea here is that I think redescription is easy enough to understand conceptually. So we showed you a triangle. It looked like a triangle. We said it's a triangle, and then we say it's something else, right? Yeah, it could be the side of a structure. It could be a hole, and so on. So conceptually, let's assume everybody gets it. So far, so good. But like with the other things that we talk about in the course. Uh, it can be harder to catch as it actually operates in your own life existentially. So for example, as you see here, yes, I get it. Things can be described in many ways. Let's move on. Versus examples like with your boss, with your wife, or with something else, where it seems to you in the moment like that's just the way it is. Just like the image that we showed seemed to you in the moment like the way it is is a triangle. Okay, then you get it conceptually. But what if you're stuck at work because your boss is a certain way, you think. Your wife is a certain way, you think. Or X is Y, and that's just the way it is. When we say that's just the way something is, we've limited the possibility of redescribing it in a way that frees up some action. Does that make sense? So the idea here is not to lie to ourselves. Like I gave this example, my $10 bill is really a $20 bill. We don't say that triangle is really a circle, you know? The goal here is not to uh, believe, hypnotize yourself into believing a lie. But the point is that if things lend themselves to several kinds of description and 
what you can do about a situation varies as a function of your description of the situation, then it becomes highly relevant in all of your situations, not just your business ones, whether you are or are not free to redescribe, you know, what's going on. So I think that this is a big deal. It's one thing to understand something conceptually and another thing to get it at the gut level where when the rubber hits the road of your life, you can do something about it in a new way. Uh, yeah, so another way of stating that, okay, another way of stating that is that we've designed this course primarily for founders, primarily with an eye to entrepreneurs, to people who are trying to create and capture value, to people who are creating something from nothing, who do need to know how do you not just have inspiration, but actually like, you don't just want the lightning to strike, you want the lightning to strike and you want the thing to catch fire and you want to harness the fire. You know, there's a whole process in building a business, not just a great idea, but its implementation and structure and all of that. So we spend a lot of time focusing on the value of these philosophical notions for founders. But at the same time, as I just conveyed to you, when you think about redescription, when you think about being in the world, when you think about the nature of the promises that you make to yourself and other people, when you think about the moral ends of your action and all of these other topics that we discuss in the course, your relationship to power and things like that, it affects you and it can inform you and benefit you whether you're a founder or not. Okay. So two kind of primary targets here, people as people and people who are in the process of creating something new in their capacity as entrepreneurs and founders. And here, uh, a summary from another perspective of what it is that this course is about and what it is that we're talking about. You don't just have abstract philosophical ideas living all by themselves, disconnected from practice projects and enterprises, and you don't have your practice projects and enterprises operating as though they can be oblivious of quote unquote abstract philosophical ideas. There's a kind of in and out, a crystallization and a spiritualization, okay? Application and elevation, whatever helps you to think about it in this cycle. This is just a more, this is just like a poetic imagistic presentation of the cycle that we referred to earlier, you know, but it shows you that there's something valuable from the point of view of just broad human wisdom in seeing how our ideas circulate through what we actually do and how reflection on what we actually do can give us clarity into our thoughts, into our relationship to community, to other people, to value creation, to inspiration. And ultimately, uh, if I can stretch it out just for the sake of this final flourish, there's even something, you know, mystical about being a philosopher entrepreneur, about crossing the threshold into the realm of creation and institution. So you get that with this image by uh, the old mystic Raymond Lull of the tree of knowledge and the sense of application, elevation, and uh, repetition and iteration. So, uh, Yosef and I, we can both say something about this, but we wanted to give you a sense. So we mentioned a little bit about Heidegger, right? Mentioned a little bit about what, it, why we're interested in non-Stoic or like other types of approaches, nothing against Stoicism, right? But the question was, how can, how can Nietzsche, how can Machiavelli, how can Plato, how can Heidegger, how can these other thinkers help us? So these are some of the other types of questions and themes that we look at in the course content. Yeah, so we we touch on power, especially uh, going through the forty eight laws of power and and Green's approach to that, and what what that can teach us. And does power have its own logic? And and uh, are we harnessing power? Is power harnessing us? Uh, the difference between personality as a fixed construct versus um, existing, and what what are the limits of existence? Uh, in the breaking of interpretive chains, and where the source of value and what value is. Um, we, we try to touch on uh, the most salient questions that, that arise when you, think, uh, when you think philosophically about business and about founding, about creating new, new ventures and the goal of those ventures and your role as the founder or as the intermediary between the idea and the instantiation of that idea. Yeah, like, for example, about power, let me just say briefly, you may have a concern, as we discussed earlier, with some moral end. Is it good? Does it contribute? Does it benefit? And think that the only way to get big enough and strong enough to be able to deliver that end is to become powerful through non-moral means. 
You know, if you're like, I need, I need to be more powerful for my business to succeed. And the only way to be powerful is to bracket or like to pause concern with morality and ethics. So that's everybody who's in, in business thinking about how to grow is going to face that type of inquiry. And we have great resources, including we're not just talking about including going through the 48 laws of power. We're saying, what are the limits of an approach to power that has you throw moral considerations out the window, for example, uh, things like that. Yeah, pretty, pretty. I mean, I, we've designed the curriculum and every time I look at these questions and topics, I get re excited about it completely because it's a very powerful, moving and uh, effective types of conversation. So that's an overview of who we are and what we do. That's an overview of the kind of inquiry that we think philosophy can have and can benefit entrepreneurship with and vice versa. One of the reasons why we think what entrepreneurs do is valuable for philosophers who are trying to understand all of these different notions. So you can find out more about the, uh, if you could go to visionxform.com. Uh, and Peter, for anybody who's watching this uh, before December 31st, who found it interesting and wants to go sign up, we have this code STOA. And uh, you guys see our Twitter, uh, Twitter handles here if you want to follow us uh, on Twitter. So with that out of the way, um, we throw it over to you. Awesome. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, give them a round of applause for the presentation and thank you for the, the generous uh, coupon. Uh, let me just stop sharing your screen. If uh, you have any questions, we're going to pivot to Q&A um, for about 15 minutes. Do you, have, do you have a hard stop, either of you, at the top of the hour? Um, no. If we go a little bit no. over 10, 15, that's cool. All right. Um, so if you have any questions, anytime, pop in the chat. I'll call and you can ask your question uh, to Michael or Yosef. Uh, I'll warm them up with a bunch of questions because uh, it's one of my favorite topics. Um, I'm curious what you think of this distinction that I often make uh, between having a philosophy versus doing philosophy um, and having a philosophy, which you can adopt the philosophy as well, um, sort of gives you coordinates and logical space of like what is and ought to be. So like Stoicism, Buddhism, modern things you can adopt as effective altruism. Um, and in contrast, doing philosophy seems like a different activity, which you guys were gesturing at in this presentation. Um, so I'm curious what you think of that distinction of having a philosophy, which you can just adopt without actually doing philosophy, and then this this art of doing philosophy. Um, and if you think that distinction is valid, uh, what do you what like what is the the main ingredients of doing philosophy? Is it inquiry? Is it reasoning? Um, and formal logic? So yeah, I'm curious what your thoughts are there. Yosef, you want to go ahead? Uh, well, I think um, when you adopt the philosophy, you what you 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 read a text generally, and then and then you take that in as you say, yes, I'm going to live by it. Uh, when when you're doing philosophy, I think that it's more of uh, you're questioning. So it's it's a it's a curiosity that gets you further and further and changes the questions and then actually changes the uh, changes the answers which ultimately lead to different questions so when you adopt a, a framework um i see uh in the chat somebody mentioning uh, ethical al altruism uh there are there are a great deal of um, baked in assumptions or there's there's a baked in philosophy yes largely of utilitarianism but largely also of egalitarianism that that is is crucial to to effective altruism as its presupposition so if you were just to adopt uh, the effective altruism as the oh i want to do the most good for for the world uh if you're just adopting it then you you know you take it hook line and sinker if you're doing the philosophy or, or using it as a starting point um then you you start uh then when you when you learn about it you question and you go into the underpinnings and perhaps you uh, reject some of those underpinnings or accept them uh, or at least understand how you feel about them and how you react. Um, I think that's, that's, that's my, uh, the first blush of how I would uh, delineate that distinction. For, uh, for me, Peter, I'm not exactly sure um, because the, the philosophers that I read and study and that I'm closest to, they don't necessarily carve it up in that way. But I would say that doing doing philosophy, engaging in the practice of philosophy, 
is primarily about thinking, getting clear on the questions. It's very much a manner of trying to get deeper into questions, concepts, notions, ideas. So it's a searching inquiry that usually proceeds through questioning. Uh, that's the way that I sort of see it. And I'm not so sure about having a philosophy. It's like there are things that when we have something, we have it as a, uh, like Leo Strauss, he put it this way, a formulation that I like. He said, all philosophers, they inquire into the constitution of reality, the nature of the whole, okay, the nature of human existence. It's an inquiry. And out of this inquiry, you can't help but incline towards a certain answer, okay? So the having a philosophy somehow is our inclining towards a certain answer concerning the fundamental questions. But at the same time, we always keep open the questionableness of the answers towards which we incline. And if we don't, if we collapse into the answer and shut off the question, it's no longer either having or doing philosophy. At that point, it's opinion closed off to questioning, it's worldview, it's ideology, it's that type of thing. So I sort of see it that way. The doing philosophy is the inquiring and the having is where it sort of crystallizes for a little bit, but you always have to keep that fire burning. But I'm not sure. It's uh, I've never really thought it through on those terms in that way. And what do you think of um, like uh, informal reasoning or formal, informal logic reasoning, just having the, the, the basics there uh, to do philosophy? Um, is that something you're teaching in the course or is that something you recommend? Yes. Yeah, so I'll, Yosef, I'll say something about it briefly and then um, and then see what uh, we can add. So we do look at the question of logical reasoning. Absolutely. In fact, we look at several approaches to what truth is truth as procedure, truth as pragmatism, you know, truth as just what works. And when we look into the relationship between logic and truth, we're forced to recognize the existence of several incompatible and irreducible logical systems. So um, I studied logic as an undergraduate, I took several classes in both non, -cla non classical logic, classical logic, uh, alternative logics, modal logic, and all these other types of things. So even what we automatically regard as quote unquote logical thinking, I'm not denying it, just saying that in philosophy here too, you have a richness of approaches. Are we dealing with truth values as just true or false? Or are we including the possibility of shades of gray and even the possibility in some logical systems of valid contradictions? Uh, so that is something that we look at, we review and we try to understand how it can help us think about business and how it can help us be better in business. Yeah, it's it's uh, logic can be a very useful tool when you have a defined goal, and uh, but an appreciation of the illogical, of the irrational, and uh, of things that are just outside of that outside of that domain. Um, you know, when uh, creative tasks um, are sort of in, in some ways independent. Uh, so not be, not being constricted by logic while appreciating it as a tool and uh, as a very effective tool for clear thinking once you have set a goal, um, understanding that balance and, and appreciating both the, the, the values and the limitations of logic is, uh, I think, the right approach. Yeah, just another way of another way of uh, another aspect of that is if logic is a kind of computation that works on a certain set of inputs, a logic itself doesn't produce those inputs. So you have a machine processing your thought, but first of all, the machine can be built in several ways, and secondly, it doesn't itself give us the inputs. So there's something that falls outside, and then we try to look at how, what falls outside and how it plays with the logical machine. Very cool. Very cool. Um... And my other question, uh, there's this paper I like by Stephen uh, Tolman uh, called The Recovery of Practical Philosophy. And uh, I guess you could say this still is part of the practical uh, philosophy movement. And uh, I'll copy and paste. He carves out philosophy in, in a different way as well. I'll put in the chat. Uh, so he says theoretical philosophy, which is ex like pretty much current academia exclusively, um, he would argue, is uh, written timeless, general, and universal. And he says practical philosophy is oral, timely, particular, and uh, uh, local. Um, so again, like I'm curious what you think of this, this curving up. And it seems like something about 
entrepreneur, uh, being an entrepreneur and running a business really makes you touch with the oral, the timely, the, the particular and the local. Um, but it strikes me as um, unwise to still ne neglect the theoretical altogether, which you were addressed uh, earlier in, um, in the presentation. So I'm curious with this philosopher entrepreneur, how would you um, filter them through this theoretical philosophy, practical philosophy divide uh, that is presented in this practical philosophy movement? Yosef, you want to go ahead? Sure. Uh, well, any philosophy come if if you start with the if if you're starting with the the approach that you are an entrepreneur, you're trying to get something done. Uh, whatever philosophy it is, in in whatever sense it exists, it has to be practical. It has to even if it's a purely theoretical construct, that theoretical construct has to enable you to see the world in such a way that that's value add um, or that that helps you be more effective. Uh, it, 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 um, it gets filtered through, through that lens because that's, that's your starting point. Um, so I, I, this distinction I think is uh, not, not very important for, for philosopher entrepreneur because any philosophy that doesn't add, add anything to you practically, either emotionally, intellectually, or in terms of your efficacy uh, in execution is just irrelevant. Yeah, so this is actually a, it's a great question that shows how even thinking about something like the relationship between timelessness and time, okay, theory and practice, whether the general and the universal are intimately related to the particular and local or whether they are just partitioned off as two separate realms, you know, that becomes very key. Is it, is it artificial and arbitrary to keep them separated in that way? So the Maybe no surprise to you, Peter, I'm not sure about the guests here, but two of the biggest influences on my thinking around this question are Martin Heidegger and Leo Strauss. In the Straussian tradition, we're dealing with political philosophers whose writing is meant in various ways to be still like a written version of what's oral, timely in particular. In other words, there's an art of writing and an art of thinking that can address practical concerns, even within the horizon of theoretical philosophy. It like it gets both at once. It's, it's not so easy to grasp how the political philosophers do that, but they do. So that it's simultaneously concerned with political requirements, which are particular timely and local, and with the universal dimension or truth about the nature of political things. So my training in political philosophy predisposes me to see the theory and the practice much more intimately connected than separated in that sense. And the other one is Heidegger. And you know, if you know something about Heidegger, that the act of philosophizing is rooted in a way of our, our existence. So it's we here now who are embodying and expressing the nature of being and time and generality and universality. So once again, they can't be kept apart so rigorously or so uh, um, artificially. That said, there could be from this lens, powerful insights that become available, and it could help at times to settle, you know, disputes and to put things in their own place. So neither Yosef nor I, even though, as you see, by default, we don't really share the view that these two things should be kept distinct. In the spirit of what we do at Vision Transform, we would always be willing to say, let's look at it from this perspective. What do we see from this perspective that we don't see from the ones that we apply as a rule, whether Straussian or Heideggerian or something else? That's one of the great things I think about the program is we practice, look from this perspective, look from this perspective, look from this perspective. We don't even get too caught up in our own pet uh, perspective, so to speak. Mine, I've said something about. Very cool. Uh... So I'll have one more uh, question, then we'll pivot to the, the questions in the chat. Um, what about wisdom? Uh, how is uh, wisdom addressed in this uh, course? And what do you see the, the role of wisdom plays with the philosopher entrepreneur? So it's a big, beautiful question. Uh, in some sense, you could say that wisdom is, and again, Yosef may have his own uh, account both for himself and you know how he sees this reflected in the course, but in some sense, 
wisdom is the elevation side when we reflect on what we've learned from our practices, what we've learned from our embodiment. But even wisdom, you know, there's a figure of wisdom as Sophia, as a personified wisdom. The personified wisdom, and I'm saying the religious tradition, the biblical tradition, mystical religion, as as a encapsulated wisdom that goes out into the world, that constructs the world, that builds the world, and that even returns back from the world. So even in the personification in the religious and mystical tradition of the figure of wisdom as Sophia, you have this going out and coming back. You know, some sense wisdom, there's also something Hegelian about this, you don't mind my saying that wisdom is reflection on a completed process. So at the start of the process, you don't have as much wisdom as you have somehow when you've gone through it. Now, in other contexts, I'm not at all a Hegelian, but in the context that we're discussing here, that you do the business, you reflect on it, you've incorporated the insights and the practices, and you somehow have uh, distilled them and crystallized them for yourself. There's wisdom in that whole process. So another one is that wisdom consists of just inquiry into, well, what does it mean to be valuable? What does it mean to be offering something of worth? What is the good? You know, it's in pursuit and in quest of those underlying questions that wisdom, I mean, what's the definition of the pursuit of wisdom in the old tradition? It's inquiry into precisely those types of foundational questions. So that's like a couple of different ways in which the importance of wisdom comes out in the uh, in the coursework and in the people that we're discussing and writing about. Yosef, you may want to add uh, something to that. Well, defining wisdom, I think, is is quite difficult and among the many definitions of wisdom, um, one of, one which I liked is understanding simple things over the very long term. I think there is a pretty natural uh, antagonism between intelligence and wisdom, whereas intelligence is the ability to understand complex things quickly, and wisdom is the appreciation of simple things. Uh, and as again, that's that's one definition of wisdom, and this appreciation of simple things um, goes goes by the wayside when you can intellectualize and rationalize complex ideas that seem to contradict it. Um, so that's that's one one perspective that uh, I found to be a, a value add, um, especially when it comes to business, because uh, it's those basic back to basic truths like uh, a business has to make a profit. You can't lose money forever. Uh, that And when that wisdom goes out the window during a bubble, for example, the dot-com bubble or others, uh, that's, uh, and, and, and the, the value is built on the theory of the greater fool, uh, uh, that's, that's when uh, there will be, a, when highly intelligent people can rationalize away and deny basic truths, basic wisdoms uh, in favor of abstractions that, uh, that blind them in a way and make them unwise. Peter, I want to just add one more thing here, which is that there's a sense when we think about wisdom of a comprehensive vision of getting the whole, not just a part of it. And so we actually do discuss that in the course with reference to Aristotle and the various ways of knowing. So Aristotle delineates different ways of different modes of knowledge, Sophia being one of them. So we explicitly actually do treat the sense of a comprehensive grasp of the whole. And we also discuss it in relationship to Ian McGilchrist and the notion of different hemispheres of the brain, whether one is extremely hyper-focused on the particulars or whether it's able to see the big picture and to incorporate the particulars into that with the notion that wisdom has something, again, of that comprehensive perception associated with it. Yeah, and the lateralization of wisdom, whereas, uh, so with, with, with McGilchrist's theory, and it's a very well substantiated theory, especially in this um, last book, the two volume, uh, The Matter With Things, um, it, it, uh, if you can imagine the, uh, the left brain hemisphere, which is focused on uh, serial processing and looking at detail, uh, whereas the right hemisphere is appreciation of the whole. And wisdom comes from, from that appreciation of the whole where uh, there is, a, there is, a, there is an, uh, an understanding of proportionality 
and an understanding of the interactivity of a system uh, in, in, a, in a way that's uh, not the same as the component parts. Uh, this, this is also the part of the basic uh, wisdom of uh, true economics, which thinks about second order and third order effects, where it's not the, the immediate effect of an intervention that is the exclusive focus of analysis, uh, that there has to be the context of the system that's taken into account where the proximal effects uh, lead to distal effects and the distal effects can actually wash out the effect of the proximal. And a good economist or a good uh, uh, analysis will try to take that into account or at least notice it uh, what, in, a, in a given experiment. So let me just, I want to say here briefly that you take a question like, what about the role of wisdom? Absolutely, perfectly fitting, appropriate and beautiful question. And you see that suddenly it opens us up into all of these different realms, the various ways of modes of cognition that we have in Aristotle, the possibility of a particular versus a universal grasp, the notion of a practical wisdom and its relationship to theoretical wisdom. And that's the kind of thing that we're trying to do, really take what seems like a basic though very nevertheless difficult philosophical notion and show how when we play it out it touches all of these different components and aspects of practical entrepreneurial business life yeah and i'm reminded that heraclitus quote uh, those who love wisdom must investigate many things uh and it seems like uh this course is quite eclectic and is investigating many things so i'm, I'm quite excited about it uh let's uh taking a few people for, for Q&A. Uh, we'll go Kevin, then uh, Brandon. Kevin, uh, if you have a, you're still here, yeah. You're on mute, Kevin. Uh, hey guys, in one of your early slides, you mentioned the, uh, you described the entrepreneur, entrepreneur as a Dionysian entity, or I don't know what exact word, wording you use, but you made a mention to the Dionysian. Um, I'm curious what you mean by that and how, like your personal experience with the uh, Dionysian relates to entrepreneurship? Uh, great question. Joseph, if you don't mind, I'll say something about this first. So a couple of different points. First of all, the founder is somebody who has to go beyond the given existing order in order to bring something into it that's not currently there. So if you're just working within a constituted realm, you haven't crossed the threshold that constitutes that realm in the first place. Whereas an entrepreneur, he does that with respect to a given domain or a given market or a given product or something like that. He has to pass beyond what's given. And the Heideggerian parallel, it's actually very profound and beautiful. You go outside of the realm of beings, the existing things, and in going outside of the realm of beings, Heidegger says, like Plato argued in the sophist, you actually go to the realm of no thing, of nothing. So not everybody always consciously crosses that realm or that threshold from what's given to, the, to bringing something new into being. But the entrepreneur does that. And in that sense, he's a liminal figure who crosses a threshold from non-being to being and creating something from nothing. It's strange, but it is there. Now, there's another element to it. If you know Peter Thiel's book Zero to One, and if you don't, I'll let you know that at the towards the end of it, he talks about the paradox of founders. And the paradox is that there are these creative uh, geniuses or whatever they happen to be, some sort of, uh, they have some privileged access or unique access to the creation of something new. And at the same time, this is the flip side, they're all a little bit crazy. And sometimes they burn out and sometimes they go mad and sometimes they do whatever. So this idea that the, the artist, the one who's genuinely crossing a threshold, also has to have a little bit of the spirit of madness in him, you know, there's something in that as well of the Dionysian. So it's that type of notion. And in my personal case, and I think, well, I'll just say right now for my own personal case, well, I guess I could say this. Yosef and I, we both have an interest in uh, what mystical traditions and what mystical practices have had to tell us in terms of wisdom and in terms of these 
ways of living that go beyond the ordinary. And somehow to be an entrepreneur or a founder, you also go beyond the ordinary. Otherwise, you'd just be satisfied with things the way they are. So uh, I always, when I'm reading, like, cause let's say a work of mystical phenomenology or something like that, which we include uh, in some of the course content, it's fascinating how it maps onto the stages of founding and the components and aspects of, uh, of founding. But that's, that's it roughly from my perspective. There's uh, this concept of the adjacent possible. So you, uh, just to follow Michael's thought, when you, when there is something new, it opens up a whole new universe. So the, the invention of uh, high-speed computation opened up computational biology. Uh, now, computational biology is fundamentally different uh, than traditional biology. I mean, it, the methods are different. The problems that are encountered are different. Um, the way uh, the, the the way that um, one would one would seek to find or um, validate mechanisms, um, well, no, not validate, but really find mechanisms is is different, and that would not exist without this enabling technology. Now you can think of uh, something um, probably more connected to the day-to-day -day life, which is Airbnb and Uber. Um, these the 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 sharing economy. These are this. It's an innovation in business model. That innovation in business model has changed our day-to-day -day life uh, dr quite dramatically. I mean, it, it in in many cities it, it vaporized the taxi services, and uh, made massively more convenient uh, transportation. Not to speak of the potential um, lives it saved due to decreases in uh, intoxicated driving, but uh, the idea. Uh, that idea, that innovation, which was executed, uh, Uber in, in the case of uh, Travis Kalanchik, uh, was, was executed at such scale and so massively successfully, um, it changed our world. Now, one of the things that opened up as soon as, as, soon as uh, Uber became a viable and scale, uh, large-scale business model is insurance on non-professional drivers. So these are so it's a new category of driver. It's a somebody without a commercial driver's license uh, being being uh, not an unlicensed taxi cab, which is technically what they were, but more of a, I, I forget the category they used. But um, and once the once once this innovation came about, there was there was even a, a meme on some VC sites uh, or, or some you know startup sites which uh, showed different categories and said like the Uber of X or the Airbnb of Y. And it was like, build your own business model. But the innovation had already happened uh, with, the, with the idea of the sharing economy and the breaking of the psychological block for Air in Airbnb's case of, well, why would you want a stranger in your house? Like, isn't that weird? Isn't that, isn't that dangerous? And uh, him believing in a world where that was the norm uh, and and making that the norm, uh, that's that's changing the world. And that that and once 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 that shift happens, then the shift is done. Then a whole new world opens up. Yeah, you see, you really have to get, as I'm sure um, you do, that an entrepreneur or a founder is a strange type of creature who reconfigures the world makes things possible for people that they never would have dreamt of before really redefines entire realms and domains and brings new ones into being. Okay. So that's like, not everybody does that. There's something somehow uniquely intense and captivating about a person who's interacting with the world in that way and able to pull that off. A uh, quick follow-up. Maybe it's not quick, but, <laughs> um, uh, when you were talking, both of you were talking, two more mythological figures or stories kind of popped up. Um, Prometheus with like stealing fire and Pandora, like opening a box. And, you know, Prometheus, he stole fire, then he was subjected to getting his guts picked out. And that, that makes me think of, say, like the automobile, right, where it's like we or like the combustion engine and gasoline. And that's sort of, I, I guess, generally, how do you think about like 
or Pandora's box, like uh, social media causing all sorts of new problems. How do you think about what's your philosophy towards like once you've, you know, like presented this solution or whatever, this new revolutionary thing to the world, um, dealing with consequences or preventing them in the first place or wh whatever, I guess. Well, I think that, uh, I think the genie's out of the bottle. We have technological progress, and unless you do some kind of world government totalitarian authoritarian suppression of the creation of knowledge, there will always be new problems associated with new technologies. And you, there, the the approach can be pessimistic that the problems are going to be greater than our ability to manage them with further uh, technological and social progress. Uh, or you can be optimistic saying, well, I would rather have, uh, have the problems associated with obesity rather than starvation due to uh, agricultural increases in agricultural efficacy and food distribution. Um, I don't think that we really have um, much of an option of going backwards. We, so uh, it's about having faith that human ingenuity and that... Uh, the methods that we have and the methods that we will have will lead us to uh, better problems rather than worse ones. Something else um, I'll just say from my perspective here about the question is that it shows us, I think, in principle that even something like looking at figures from myth can be a valuable way of structuring and organizing our thought about ongoing practices, including political practices. So in other words, one of the things that we do, it was up on a slide, is a domain mapping. So we take a domain, the domain of myth, where you have Prometheus and so on, and you say, when we take these figures, and when we take these ideas, and we use them and map them over onto some problem that we're dealing with, can they help us have new access to it, quick and easy way of operating with it? So I think that would be an example of that, trying to do that type of transposition. As far as the like substantive question, right? The substantive question in some sense is the genie out of the bottle and have we opened the Pandora's box? I'll just say that what's surprising from the point of view of the, some of the older authors like Aristotle, for example, he actually raises the question in his book, The Politics, what would a society look like that had automated the tasks of the slaves? So in Aristotle, there are slaves, some and he argues by nature, some by convention. In other words, laborers, let's say manual laborers, workers, not free men. And he asks, what does a society of automated labor imply for a free republic? Now, that is just to say that even our contemporary concerns about the nature and limits of technology, its pros and cons and whatever, however you want to characterize it, is something that philosophy helps us to think through, both through political philosophy, like Aristotle, both through the philosophical analysis of myth, like Prometheus, and even contemporary thinkers like Heidegger, who wrote a lot about the essence of technology and of a technological attitude towards the world. So we're not here to say, you know, take this position and run with it, but how do we think more clearly about all of that that give you a sense of how we would, uh, how we would do it? So I really want to point out, though, that you can somehow think these problems through using figures from myth, if need be in a useful way, like we did with Sophia, like we do with Dionysus, and like in principle you could do with Prometheus or with Pandora. Awesome, thanks, Kevin. Um, I'm just being mindful of time. We have one more question in the chat. Uh, uh, should we go to it or should we uh, close here? Let's take Let's, it and wrap. All right, uh, Brandon, you got a question. Yes. Uh, so in the wake of the FTX and Sam Bankman fried a fiasco, which has undermined the reputation of effective altruism, which uh, you guys briefly mentioned there during the presentation. So I'm wondering if we could formulate a more holistic vision of philosophical entrepreneurship and uh, philanthropic endeavors um, for good. And how could we articulate such a vision? It is uh a common uh, criticism of EA is that it is too utilitarian, too dependent on quantification of the good. Can we formulate a compelling 
framework for philosophical business that would be more open-ended in its assessment and application of the good and not requiring rigid metrics while still being compelling to potential business investors. And uh, I know this would probably take, you know, hours to really do justice. So if you, I guess, if we're kind of uh, running short on time, you can just, you know, say what you can within the time we still have. Um, well, I'll, uh, I'll give a quick stab at it. Um, in terms of the FTX and the SBF fias fiasco, um, I think he, he made statements saying that he was using EA as a smokescreen and saying platitudes in order um, to, move, to move ahead. Um, EA is something that uh, is highly utilitarian and does, in my opinion, borrow its appeal from its ability to quantify uh, and in in business, what gets measured gets managed. Uh, and any way you can quantify impact uh, is, is seductive. Uh, in terms of quantifying the good, that, uh, that may not be so easy and may be altogether impossible. But uh, that, as, 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 uh, as you correctly noted, that would take uh, some more time to unpack or think through. Some of what we do in the course that's valuable is we go through, for example, there's a platonic dialogue on what does it mean to love gain? Okay, what, who is the lover of gain? Is love of gain good or bad? What counts as gain? Have you gained if you've acquired something that made you worse? Is that a gain or a loss? Is gain equivalent to acquisition? So there is a kind of inquiry that you can make into the nature of the good, into accounts of the good, that doesn't depend on quantification doesn't depend on calculation or computation, but it just depends on the qualitative high quality inquiry that we learn by studying the philosophers who have done it. And in fact, one of the things that we begin to see clearly is just how much the dominance of a quantification interpretation of the world where everything is reduced to what can be calculated, computed, quantified, and have, has a number slapped onto it how that uh, obviously it enriches us in some ways, but it impoverishes us in crucial ways. And we wanna restore a balance, I think, through some of the philosophical inquiry to the world that doesn't lend itself to computation, but still is compelling, not only to investors, but to partners, to users, to builders. There's something compelling about that qualitative world that can be brought to light. And that's one of the things that we uh, try to do for sure. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Brandon. Um, so we'll close up here. Uh, Michael, uh, Joseph, any um, parting words you would like to leave us with today at the STOA? Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Uh, very enjoyable spending this evening with you. Absolutely. Thanks, Peter. It's a real pleasure. Uh, thanks to you and your guests. Awesome. Uh, and thank you uh, both for coming today at the STOA. I'm going to put all the, the links on the show notes so you can, can check that out. I'm very curious of how this project uh, progresses and evolves. Um, and uh, I'll plug the next event coming up. Uh, our philosopher in residence for January is going to be Sebastian Marshall. The very related topic is going to call it uh, industrial philosophy, bringing the scientific mindset back to philosophy. Uh, he's going to talk about some of the characters like Peter Thiel and Elon Musk in his uh, series. So you can check that out at stoa.ca. So that being said, uh, Michael Joseph, everyone, thank you for uh, so much for coming to Stella today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Merry Christmas. <laughs>